Today's video is a clip from my membership site from the field.tv. This is the place that I post 95% of the content that I now make. It's all hyper detailed, no clickbait, no catchy thumbnails, no catchy titles. It is all with the intent of delivering high value information to you guys. The last 18 months of me traveling around North America, visiting experts in regenerative and sustainable agriculture, as well as some high tech farms, it's all up there. And all the videos of me developing my new farm are up at fromthefield.tv. Head over there and check it out. My guest today is Dan Cloutier, and in this video, Dan and I will be discussing some of the major problems coming around the corner with agriculture and the food system. And uh, you might be familiar with Dan. We visited him last year at his aquaponics greenhouse, which is at the uh, Sprung headquarters. Dan has a company called ARC Agro Resilience Kit. Dan does a lot of consulting uh, for greenhouses and sustainable uh, regenerative energy product projects and I consider Dan an expert in that field. Him and I often have conversations about problems and solutions. He's a big thinking guy. He's got a lot of ideas and a lot of solutions. And in this video, Dan kind of outlines some of the bigger problems with the agriculture food, the agricultural conventional food system that's coming around the corner, food inflation, energy inflation, and fertilizer inflation. And Dan is going to present 11 solutions to these. And you're gonna love how so much of this comes back to solutions that we as small farmers can take and do something with right now. So I hope you get a lot of value out of this one. We, we did a, uh, a video not very many weeks ago, uh, Curtis, and I don't want to repeat uh, very much of that. But I do find that there's um, uh, not very many. I'm, I'm in front of people every day that are looking at... Uh, redoing, adding, setting up for the first time, uh, all sorts of, of controlled environment agriculture yeah. uh, systems. And, uh, you know, a lot of them have done a great job of, of, of research, but I would say it's the mi minority that say, oh, you know what, um, I'm not sure that being in an insulated building uh, and having to use 100% artificial lights isn't the lowest energy approach. Yeah. But the fact is, is generally, it is not the lowest energy approach. Now, there's not one size fits all. Like if I look at how what Grove is growing, natural light into that building would have pretty negligible effect. Those plants are so close together and those towers create so much shade and so forth. Right. Um, and they're creating a certain amount of heat anyway and blah, blah, blah. Um, odds are being in, in an insulated building is probably their best approach. But as, as we talked about last time, you know, the, the numbers suggest that it's not just the artificial lights, but... It's all the fans and cooling and dehumidification, which is cooling, that drives your cost in an insulated building to $8 a square foot on average versus a greenhouse, which is under a dollar. Yeah, not even close. Exactly. And, and then, um, you know, what greenhouses haven't taken advantage of is these kinds of, of uh, you know, virtually free cooling systems. So swamp coolers are considered really inexpensive, and they are as compared to compression-driven uh, uh, air conditioning or what have you. But, you know, for this 4,200-square-foot greenhouse, we would run a, swamp coolers that would use at least 5 kilowatts per hour. But doing it this way, you know, we're at, uh, you know, a quarter of a kilowatt um, to, to, to run a pump. And we also use 50% the amount of water as, as swamp coolers. Well, that's how we'll end up with more arable land and many uh, fewer calories, uh, you know, of energy used for, per calorie of food. So, yes, yeah, so I'll remind folks, you know, 
the, the coolest air is close to the ground and when we have screens that we can open and, and have wind turbines that uh, just turn because of the temperature differential and it sucks the hot air out through the peak, we're, we're creating a, a bit of a current when we mist that and we cap recapture that misting, what that means is that in a microclimate, we can create m virtually all the breezes and wind in the world are created by temperature differentials. So we create that in our microclimate and we can cool a space by 20 degrees C below ambient. So we can do that in greenhouses we're doing some work right now with some some livestock stuff and you know we were looking at well you know every every cow in a in a dairy barn for example or a hog in a hog barn they're like um filling those those facilities with uh walking furnaces and so in in a, a relatively small space they would spend um, about twenty uh, or two two hundred and forty thousand dollars plus seventy thousand for electrical install, uh, just to have enough fans to cool those those spaces, and then they'll use an additional almost sixty thousand dollars of electricity running the fans, and the fact is is the approach and technology that we're using is. Uh, you know, was only first used about 800 years ago in in the Middle East, and um, can be adapted for these sorts of things, and just dramatically uh, drive down the amount of heating and cooling. How many greenhouses have you seen, Curtis? I know you have one, and 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 they're certainly growing, and and uh, mostly in hobby greenhouses. But how many commercial greenhouses have you heard of or seen? that actually have a climate battery. I don't think I've actually seen any. <laughs> I mean, my, my greenhouse was a commercial greenhouse for a period of time, but I, be, outside of that, nobody's really doing this. No, like what I would say is uh, Shandong province in China, Yes, they find that they have uh, about 70% less utility costs than um, their peer, in Holland. Now, I understand in Holland, why wouldn't you do this kind of stuff with weeping tile in Holland? Because uh, they're yeah. below sea level. Right. It'll just right. fill with water. Right. right, of course, of course. <laughs> so, you know, if I've got hot air that I'm using a fan to move down, and, and basically this is my heat exchanger, and I'm trying to do an air to water exchange, and water is 800 times the density of air, I need an awful lot of air to make any differential. Right. So is Holland doing it right? I think they are. Okay, I, 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 their context, of course. Uh, yeah, but now they export to the rest of the world and all these people say, well, you know, the, 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 the Dutch are really, really good at this. Well, yes, they are, absolutely they are. Uh, but the Chinese have proven because of their context, they don't look at all these other places, which is most of the world, where climate battery, passive solar heating and cooling can make, like China, Shandong province, only a 70% difference in your second highest cost of production in a greenhouse. Seems pretty darn important. Mm-hmm but it's, it's missed. And then we also do a lot of things. I'll, I'll start with the, the root cellar uh, first. You know, I don't know exactly what reasons, what possessed us in all regards to get away from root cellars. But it's a pretty inexpensive uh, and really great way to uh, store a lot of stuff. Absolutely. And, and then something that I f feel kind of foolish that I never thought about or really knew about um, un until last couple of years is, you know, I, I always wondered why a, a carrot, um, you know, that we most often have eaten in the past, 
tastes like a piece of wood, you know, not, not very long after it's been out of the ground. Yeah. I would argue that the number one culprit for that is the fact that when it's in a compression driven refrigerator, there's virtually no humidity in that refrigerator. Right. And so it's dehydrating the carrot. And when you dehydrate something, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas in the root cellar, it doesn't dehydrate at all. That's right. And and so not everything, you know, is is, you know, not to say you won't want to keep having fridges, but when you think about the amount of of uh fridges that people put in place and they could do just as well with a root cellar, um it it's very, very uh worthwhile exploring. Now we like layering things. So, you know, we did a bunch of debating uh, where were we going to put our root cellar and we've added a, a, a section of, of root cellar in our uh, passive solar heating and cooling uh, trench. Oh, that's interesting. So, you know, just trying to uh, multi-purpose things and, um, you know, w w of course, we looked at saying, well, you know, with the volumes we're doing and stuff and, and uh, field crop, uh, and we want to store, you know, hundreds of pounds of, of carrots and, and um, potatoes, uh, well, maybe we need to, to purchase a, a, a cooler. And they're not that expensive and stuff, and they're not that expensive to run, but it's it's that energy intensity we just talked a little bit earlier about yeah so you know what what's compost heating well how many greenhouses do you know that actually just uh burn off all their tomato stocks at, at the end of their season we'll burn them off in what way you mean just by pulling them They'll out literally throw them in a fire oh really and, i've actually and, and i can't say that barrel. i've seen that wow significant number will will do that there's there's a number that if they have an outdoor uh crop they'll they'll use that uh as uh, you know kind of on on soil composting they'll they'll turn that into the land and and so forth but what you'll very very rarely see in in commercial greenhouses around north america is a compost heater yeah no never but, you know, this is a, a university that studied it, and they said, well, when do you need the, comp the heating? Um, in, in the coldest months. That's, mm -hmm. you know, a few hours that the uh, climate battery uh, heating perhaps can't uh, uh, keep up, and you, you'd like some at night and so forth. So anyway, I mean, what did they do? They designed a system that you can fill it up, uh, with compost in the center, the, the black outside is PEX pipe, and then around this PEX pipe, what are they doing? Well, they're putting uh, bales of straw around that, so they're insulating it in the cold. So this PEX pipe becomes, again, your heat exchanger. So my, my uh, glycol will, will get heated up by the compost, we got a trench underground, and we uh, bring that hot water in essentially creating, uh, in this case, grow beds that um, will keep those uh, roots all nice and warm, just like an in-floor uh, mm -hmm. heating system. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, if the roots are warm, the plants, that goes a very long way for the plants to feel like summer's extended. Right? Yeah. Interesting. So... Uh, just literally typical permaculture stuff, isn't it? Well, what's my waste stream? What can I yeah. do with it? Yeah, I've always, I'm always a little skeptical on these. I've, I've seen it. I've been to a number of farms where they're kind of playing around with these. I, I can't say that I've ever seen anybody try this and try and apply this commercially. Um, but I wonder if there's a reason for that, because I wonder if the amount of time put into this 
really gives you a return on the amount of heat units that make a difference? Well, I think that um, for a lot of the time, and you, and you come back to, you know, juxtaposition 1900 and, and then after, you know, I think our ancestors were not foolish about these things. They, I think they answered exactly what you're looking at. And they go, geez, I can do all this stuff and it's labor and, I, you know, I can get nice soil and I can get some compost revenues perhaps. Uh, but, you know, natural gas is really inexpensive and I can just heat with it, right? No fuss, no bother to speak of, right? Yeah. So there's a lot to be said for that. Mm-hmm. 